Sea of Galilee. Now to put that into perspective, in 1986, the hull of a fishing boat was excavated from the shore of Galilee. They carbon dated it and they showed it to be from Jesus' time. That particular boat was 26.9 feet long, it was 7.5 feet wide, and 3.9 feet high. And it would have held approximately 15 people, four of which would have been the ones who would have been rowing. So presumably that would have been a similar kind of boat to what Jesus and his disciples would have been in on this particular trip. And so you think the potential of 30 foot waves and you're in a 26.9 foot long boat, that's, that's a bad day. That's a bad day on the lake. And <laughs> Mark describes this as a furious squall. He says the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now I know as kids, we love to take my dad's little fishing boat out in the middle of the lake and we'd jump off it and water would splash in. And I remember one time, my brother can attest to this, we're diving in. All of a sudden, water started to fill that boat. And you know what was happening to daddy's fishing boat? It started to sink. And so we were swimming like the dickens to try to pull that thing to shore before that sank to the bottom of that lake because we wouldn't have probably seen the light of day. <laughs> So here, the boat is getting swamped and it's getting filled with water. And in a lot of ways, that's life. At one moment, we're doing fine, and then the next moment, the bottom falls out. We're one phone call away from finding ourselves in the middle of a storm, or one doctor's visit away from being in the middle of a storm. And if we're not careful, those storms of life can cause us to doubt who God is. Verse 38 says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Those words reflect just how the disciples really understood who Jesus was at this point. In a moment of crisis, their faith fails. And there's this gap between them and Jesus. And who jumps in to fill that gap? None other than the enemy, Satan himself. Fills the gap with, with doubt and with fear and anxiety. And fear was normal in these type of circumstances. It was scary out on the water like that. And even four of the disciples were experienced fishermen. And they knew how to handle a boat. And they would have understood the lake. And it wasn't their fear, though, that was separating them from Jesus. What separated them from Jesus was their lack of understanding who he was. They accused Jesus of not caring rather than asking him for help. And they said, don't you care? When they could have just walked over and kind of gently nudged him and said, hey, it's getting a little rough out here. You want to help us out? But instead, it was, boom, they start with the accusation. But don't you care if we drown? How could you be sleeping? I say that about Dennis and I fall asleep all the time. Like, how could you be sleeping? He just, just, he's, man, he's an expert sleeper. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the movie. And then we have to watch the movie again the next night so we can see the ending. But, the, but that's the beautiful side of marriage. <laughs> so in order to get past their fear, they have to recognize that Jesus isn't some ordinary human being who just happens to preach or heal. They need to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus himself actually is God incarnate. And it's one thing to learn about God when you're sitting in a church service and they sit through a sermon and to learn a couple of juicy little tidbits. It's totally another thing to learn about God when you have lost a loved one. Or when you can't afford to pay your bills because you've lost your job. Or when your health begins to fail or your marriage begins to fall apart. It's in those moments where you really learn who God is. When you are in the, just the pit of despair and there's, there's nothing else that you can reach out to but God himself. And some lessons can only be learned in the middle of a storm. Verse 39, it says that he got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. 
and then the waves died down and it was completely calm. Quietly still. He demonstrated at that moment his authority over nature. And he says, when he said to them, why are you so afraid? Why do you have no faith? And they said, don't you care? Notice in verse 38 too, they, at that moment they called him teacher. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Or in other parts of the gospel, they call him Lord. They call him teacher. They didn't really understand. They don't think who he was. And they questioned his love for them. And this is the temptation that we too have, I think, sometimes when we're afraid. Because of the storms of life, we see God as less than he is. And we doubt his love. And we doubt how much he cares. And we allow fear to blind us. But yes, storms, I firmly believe, are necessary. There's a reason why Jesus tells us that we are going to, that this side of heaven is not going to be easy. It's during the storms of life that our faith is stretched and that we really learn about who he is, but also who we are as his people. Verse 41 says, they were afraid and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Up until now in Mark's gospel, Jesus had just been going around performing miracles. And what happens here is no mere miracle. It's not a mere exorcism or healing or a magic trick. This is a sign. And all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout Scripture, there are signs that point people towards God. And at his command, the, wind, the winds calm, the waves settle, and the storm passes. And the calming of this storm is pointing to Jesus as so much more than just a mere man who performs miracles or heals lepers. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah that they have been waiting for. And prophets of the past, they performed things like this. They would have healed sick, cleansed lepers, but this time it's different which causes them to say, who is this? And they're starting to realize this is not who we thought he was. And I think it's important for us to, I think, to look at this and this, who is this? It's probably something that we've all asked one time or another about our own faith. Who is this Jesus? Who is this? What's going on here? Don't you care? That I'm drowning? Now the Gospels, the beautiful thing about the Gospels is I think they're a mirror as to which we can look in and that we look into and what we see reflected back at us. It's, it's the way that we are supposed to be living our lives as, as Bible-believing Christians. What reflects back at us. We are those disciples in the boat when we demand, where is God? And here's the beautiful reality, though, and this isn't good, probably going to sound like such good news to some people, but you're either headed into a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're coming out of one. And God is teaching you something. Whatever, wherever you are, if you're going into it, you're in the middle of it, or you're coming out of it. You are learning something about who you are, and you're learning something about who he is, and you're learning about that power that is, that is Jesus. Because this side of heaven, this world is corrupt and evil. This is Satan's playground. We're not meant for this place. We're created for something so much more. And these storms of life are an opportunity for us to see God on display and to allow for God to be glorified through the way that we, the way that we are when we go through things and who we are when we come out of it. I look at my own life and I look back at the hot mess that was my life and the grace of God that poured down on me and the mercy in those moments when I did it. I don't deserve it standing here today. We don't deserve, what we deserve is death. But what we get is a gracious God who stands up in the middle of the storm and calms the storm and offers life. And not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some of them come to clear a path. Sometimes there's a gentle pruning that needs 
needs to happen, and sometimes there's just an all-out for those of you who garden. You just need to shear them edges right down to nothing, right? And stump grind and grind those poor hair and move them out of the way. Sometimes there's some things that need to be cleared out of the way, some people that need to be cleared out of the way. Say that again. The whole forest, right? Because we can't. We don't always have the ability to see what's beyond. And there may be some people in your life that are around you who are toxic, but we don't see them as toxic because they're family or because they love me or whatever, whatever they, it is that they give to you in the midst of the mess. But God has something that's so much more. And we tend to surrender to and to serve whatever we think is going to give us life. We're looking to be at peace, and we're seeking this peace, and we're and and you're, we're not going to find it in the things of the world. You may enjoy yourself for a little bit, but you're always going to be left hungry for more. So every word that you say, every choice that you make, every action you take, it's shaped by how you view Jesus. The words that flow out of your mouth when you're speaking to somebody, that's a reflection of how you see Jesus. The way that you react when a storm comes in and you're being knocked all over the place, it reflects what you think of Jesus and how you see his power. Is he just a mere man? Just an ATM machine that you can punch in your code and get some goodies for today and then move, and move on? Or is he the son of man who gave his life up to save your life? And I'm not perfect by any means, but I can say this. I, I try as best as I can to give all of my life and to lay it down before the throne of God because Left to my own devices, I can't even imagine where I would be today if it wasn't for Jesus. <clears throat> we're doomed if we're left to our own devices. Our character is formed in these 10,000 or maybe even 20,000 little mundane moments. And they point, all these little tiny moments, they point us to something that's bigger something huge in our struggle with sin and our need for grace that can only be found in our Savior, Jesus. We can't save ourselves. And we have the resources, and we have the knowledge, and we have the mandate, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit, but all that we really lack is the will and the courage and what better day than today to finish the job? Tim, if you want to start again, and those out there would be great. We're going to transition into communion. And before we come to the communion table,
So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. He writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And here's the part that stings. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And, and I read that, even for me, that when we come to the Lord's table, that we should come to the Lord's table in a way that is worthy of the sacrifice of his death for us. Which means coming with a pure heart. And we all sin. And we all make mistakes. And we've all done some pretty stupid stuff. But I want to just leave just a little bit of silence in my prayer for you to give over to God whatever it is that you're carrying tonight. To lay it at the foot of the throne so that he can take it from you because it's not yours to carry. He died so that you could be set free. So Father God, we just thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we thank you that just as the disciples are in the boat and they didn't understand who who Jesus was, we too lose sight of who you are. And we get caught up in the, in the ways of the world and we get caught up in our own selfish desires and, and we don't come to you and ask you what it is that you want from us before we make choices and decisions and often get ourselves into a hot mess because of it. Lord, we confess that we sin against you. We are so incredibly grateful that you are a God who forgives. That you are a God because of your willingness to die on a cross. Those sins, you die for our sins, both past, present, and future. And so, Lord, in the silence, I just ask that you hear the prayers of your people as we confess before you. And we give over to you and just ask for your forgiveness. Hear our prayers. Thank you, Father, that when we repent that we are forgiven. And that we are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you that we don't have to be perfect. That your mandate is for us to love as you first loved us. So may that be the cry of our heart going forward. And as we partake in communion, Lord, may that sacred moment be a reminder that we are saved and we are saved by grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. As often as you partake in it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And in the same manner, after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup of blessing, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood 
of Christ. Thank you, Lord. May we never forget the sacrifice that you did for our behalf. Thank you for loving us and for accepting us. And may we do the same for those we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen.
couple of years at the end of those Zoom days. But in the midst of that, I, I, my hope and my prayer for you is that you still can understand that even in the midst of those Zoom days, that God is looking out for you, that he's caring for you, that he's protecting you, and that he's, he has everything that you need right there if you just ask for it. So as you leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.